Kidney Warriors, this is James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live, and this actually is video number 89 in my journey from kidney failure to kidney great, and there's nothing magical about it. I just use diet and lifestyle changes to improve my health, to reduce the burden of my kidneys, to get my life back, to get my energy back, to kick kidney disease to the curb. This is also the third night of Dadvice TV's Kidney Health Week, where we are streaming live every single night, August 1st through August 7th. And tonight, oh boy, do we have a guest. For the first time ever, we actually have a nephrologist with us. Woo! <laughs> I heard him giggle a little bit in the background there. Um, now, let me go ahead and bring him on so that we can kind of jump right in. I know I usually go into a long monologue, but I know you guys are going to have so many questions tonight because uh, we're going to talk about the frustrations of kidney care from both the nephrologist's point of view, you know, the doctor, the kidney specialist, and from the kidney patient point of view. All right. So let me bring on our special guest. This is... Dr. Kassim Butt. Hey there, how you doing? Good, man, how you doing? Hey, doing great. Let me get us both up here on the screen, boom. Now, yeah. you are very unlike all the other nephrologists that are out there. You are very active, you're very pro-health, diet, lifestyle. You've got a YouTube channel, you've got a Facebook page. You create some of the most funniest, at least in my opinion, um, and helpful, <laughs> videos because a lot of times you go and you look at a doctor's video <laughs> snore fest okay it's hard to understand it's just whoosh, they're talking way over our heads um not enjoyable and they go on for hours to cover one little simple thing your videos you add style you add some humor you're right to the point you're the doctor you're telling us what we need which makes them so so unique so i encourage everyone out there to look for your Facebook page. And actually, let me bring up your the screen with just you. It's got your, your handle right there. Uh, there's the handle right next to his name down in the bottom. Look for that on Facebook. Make sure to subscribe to him. And then on YouTube, his channel is called Your Kidneys, Your Health. Hey, that's an awesome yeah. title. <laughs> well, thanks. I need to hire you as my agent. <laughs> no all you got to do is just keep coming here every so often we'll get you in front of lots of people they're going to love you they're going to subscribe they're going to watch your videos they're going to share your videos and that's going to make you a superstar on the internet uh, it's, appreciate it, that man appreciate it's it. so rare for us to find a nephrologist who I, I don't want to sound mean but that is helpful so many of them um won't go online. It maybe it's technology. Maybe they're a little bit worried about how to approach it, how to uh, the style of their video. But you said no. I'm going to make it easy to understand. I'm going to make it enjoyable, add a little bit mm -hmm. of pizzazz, some humor to it, um, and it's just so 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 easy to um, watch your content. And you do a great job. Something I am awful at at keeping them short, which is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's. <laughs> Kind of key, you know, um, I realize nowadays, especially with internet, uh, social media, um, you know, people's attention span is so short. Mm -hmm. So, I, and initially when I started, it, I made videos nine minutes long. Well, I did one about hypertension. Y'all can watch it. It's about nine minutes long. But you you yourself know there's a thing called watch time. Yep. And after a certain point, people just check out. And so what I've realized is keep them about three minutes, and that's my goal, um, about three minutes. Um, hit the topic hard, but make it simple, no big words. I hate in nephrology that we use big words. <laughs> um, and you go over people's heads, they don't understand, um, and they check out. And then you get the get, get the, this conventional like kind of nod, like, hey, oh, yep, I yep. understand. But it's a lie. It's they a don't. Right lie. It's they a don't. Right lie. And I hate that nod. 
you know, so um, I've tried to break it down. No big words. I think in nephrology, we need to get rid of the word nephrology. We need to get rid of the word renal and just mm -hmm. say kidneys um, and then kind of go from there. Um, so, you know, uh, but overall, kidneys are a very complex uh, topic, a complex, complex organ themselves. Yep. So it's, it's difficult to explain it to people. People think, oh, it just makes urine. But it go there's so much that goes into what the kidneys do. Exactly. Um, electrolyte balance, hormonal balance, vitamin D, hypertension, um, you know, involved, you know, with your everything else. Also, this kind of like they're kind of like the canary in coal mine. Yeah. Um, and not to not to put um, not to put down the other doctors, but, you know, as nephrologists, we're very analytical people. We're mm -hmm. very analytical. And so analytical people have a tendency to kind of be analytical. You know, um, I kind of equate going to a nephrology convention as going to a Star Trek convention. Uh -huh. You know, it's like the same amount of dorks there. And so, um, so hey, I'm and, always at the Star Trek convention, and I'm the guy who's paying the fifty bucks to get a signed picture that I brought I with am, me. <laughs> I am big on the Star Trek convention, next Yay! generation and old school. I'll go James T. Kirk and Captain Picard. I don't know the newer people, but yep. at the same time, um, you know, that connection, you and me can connect on that dork level, but a lot yep. of people can't. And so uh, I think you have to kind of make it entertaining a little bit, uh, kind of funny, uh, but also use simple knowledge, a simple, uh, simple language, just use yes. simple language. Um, you know, the average American newspaper is read, read in, uh, written, written in like seventh grade English. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if anyone has a newspaper, but it's written in very simple English. Because people uh, don't have that, you know, large art. Even when you, when you talk about nephrology words, college educated people have a hard time understanding. Yep. So like, you have to kind of kind of dumb it down, kind of explain it, and kind of hit topics that are that they would like, you know, uh, or enjoy, and yep. then eventually go from there and get into get into other ones. Yeah. Now before we jump into this, let's let's give people a little bit of a insight on who you are, your experience. Yeah. You're you're down in Texas. Yes, uh, I am. San Antonio, and I, I hate to tell you, I did not look on a map on where San Antonio was. Um, I used to live in Wichita Falls. So that's kind oh, of a... Really? Yeah, does, do you, you know where that is? Does that ring a bell? Yeah, north of Dallas, isn't it? North of yeah, Dallas. Yeah, 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 north of Dallas. My dad was in the Air Force all over the place, and I know you went to school uh -huh. in Louisiana. Alexandria, yeah. Louisiana, love the Shreveport. food. Yeah, yeah. Yeah! I was right in the yeah. middle. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> And then also over in Pensacola, Florida, not too far away. Um, yeah. And just so people know, I'm going to tell you something. And I, we didn't talk about this earlier, but you look very young. You look great for your age. Um, oh, appreciate that. I, I think a lot of people may think like, how much? Are you much hitting on me right now, sir? How Are much? Ex <laughs> no. <laughs> people may think, how much experience does he have? Uh, yeah. I don't expect you to tell your age, but you've been doing this for quite a long time. How long have you been? Um, a nephrologist. Um, I've been a nephrologist for about 10 years now. Well, uh, I've been practicing in private practice for 10 years. So I got yep. out of training fellowship in 2010. I actually became a doctor in 2005, but, um, you do internship, your, uh, sorry, internship, your residency and your fellowship. And so to, since 2010 is since I've been practicing. So 10 years and I've stopped, I've been in the same practice. So I've stayed in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is I actually do, um, not besides this regular nephrology, I actually do interventional nephrology. Um, mm -hmm. So for those of your listeners, uh, listen, watchers, uh, so what do we call them? The audience. <laughs> the hey, they're kidney there. warriors. Yeah. For the kidney warriors out there. Kidney warriors <laughs> out there. The kidney warriors that are on dialysis. So if you have a problem with your access, uh, your fistula, your graft, um, and it's clotted or it's not working, I can unclot it. I can put balloons in. I put stents in. And then if you have, if you need a catheter for dialysis where they put it in your neck, I can do those as well too. So mm -hmm. um, I have that kind of capability as well too. So it's kind of cool. It adds a different, um, different uh, was it weapons under my arsenal, I guess. Yep. But it also adds a different level of care. So it's kind of cool. It's that to me, it's that experience. Because um, one of the challenges as a kidney warrior is I I I run into doctors who just they don't really get it. They don't really understand. Um, yeah. and a lot of times I think it's because they're, they're too narrow in the experience. And if they, you know, worked more with dialysis patients, I think that would give them a bit more insight. Um, mm -hmm. it, so many people, when I talk to them, they agree, you know, their doctor is like, oh, you've got anemia, you know, y your hemoglobins are low, blah, blah, blah. Um, get some rest. You'll feel better. <laughs> 
No. There's no amount yeah. of rest to get rid of anemia. We got to dress yeah. it and take care of it. You know, get the hemoglobins yeah. up so we then we can feel better. And I, I feel that your experience, it, it's wide enough that you have more insight into that. And your style, from what I've seen, if I was one of your patients, I'd be like, oh, this is awesome. I'm gonna go into the doctor, I'm gonna bring a list of questions, and I'm gonna ask questions, I'm gonna get real answers. Um, oh, no, see, I, I would actually love that, like if my patients came in, just yep. like that. But, uh, you know, I know we talked about this, but, you know, you guys have, and your audience um, has that frustration where you don't think um, that the doctors are engaging or mm -hmm. not, you know, participating, right? Well, yep. in my my fact, I actually like to teach, and I find a lot of patients out there aren't really engaged either, yep. um, or not receptive to the education. So I'm big on education, but half the game of education is being receptive to the education. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when I'm doing my spiel, and I love doing my spiel, it's laying on deaf ears. Yeah. So that is my frustration as well too, because I'm like, hey, you can change this, like yourself, like your story is like amazing, right? Yep. I really believe your story is is uh, is, uh, is trans can translate to other people, you know, is well, multipliable. Yeah. I did you nothing totally special, nothing magical. I just yeah. was, I had to face, well, I, I had to face dialysis, but really I had to face the potential of dying. That was the big thing. Yeah. Um, and that makes you think of things completely different. And to me, that was yeah. like an, a life altering event where I'm like, oh my goodness, I have to change. I can't go on dialysis. I will lose my job. I won't be able to travel, do what I, I how am I going to pay the mortgage? Uh, remember, like, I had oh, just absolutely. bought a new house, like maybe three months before I was diagnosed. I had to change. And then I just started looking, what do I need to do? And I listened to the doctors. Yeah. And when they so told me, me what to do, I followed to a T and, and nothing special. That's all I did. It's just basic nutrition yeah. and exercise and stuff. Well, the thing is, what's interesting is like we talked about diet and stuff, and I'm not, uh, I don't like to uh, tell everyone one uh, one diet for everybody. I think you have to kind of mix it up. But what we have to understand is the standard American diet is such utter crap. Oh yes. Um, you know, I mean, the standard Western diet is it's called the meat and sweet diet, right? Excessive meat um, and excessive like carbohydrate, simple carbohydrates. So I feel like subtle changes of getting rid of some of those carbohydrates and maybe adding more uh, more um, plant based nutrition. Yep. could just make that difference. And again, not being all vegan, not, you know, going off and being a hippie in the woods. I'm saying just add more uh, ve veggies in your diet um, mm -hmm. and, you know, eat less simple carbohydrates, the sugars, the sodas, um, the chips, all those little things, these little things like you made. And I think we could have a massive change in um, Amer American healthcare as a whole. Um, oh, yeah. And unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I think many nephrologists and nephrologists aren't unique in this. But, you know, it, as far as how we're trained, we're trained in medicine, right? Mm -hmm. We're trained in how medicine, uh, allocating medicine to people for problems. We're not really treated in prevention. And prevention is not like, to me, it's not colonoscopies, mammograms, uh, you know, the standard when you're checked. But prevention is diet, exercise, um, you know, diet and exercise, eating right, that kind of thing, and yep. lifestyle changes. Exactly. That's what we can prevent. And so I, I think that's one of my biggest frustrations it's like i get no satisfaction in adding the 10th or 11th medication in someone's regimen mm -hmm. you know like i and i've seen that trust me i've seen this like i've seen people up to 15 20 medications and and it's, and it's almost like a lie we tell ourselves right that we're actually doing something for a patient by the time you're at say five medications you're juggling those medications like it's hard for you to even comprehend oh, yeah. how to take those some of them are twice a day three times a day and again you're if you're a seven year old person maybe not even high school educated um, how do you even manage, how do you even manage those, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and oftentimes the pill burden itself is like a meal. Like it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. it's like a meal. So I'm like, Hey, you know, um, you know, do, do, do they need to be on all these medications and maybe simply ask them to go for a walk every day, 30 yep. minutes a day, five days a week. Um, you know, cutting out certain foods may actually improve their outcome and, and decrease that pill burden. On them, you know, I, that's exactly what it was for me. I, I managed my blood pressure so that I stopped yeah. further damage from that. I dropped all the ibuprofen because that was my problem yeah. was using ibuprofen for a year after a car accident. Yeah. Um, and then I started walking 
you know, simple yeah. things. And even this morning, I went for a walk. Then this afternoon, I went for a walk with my daughter. She was roller skating. It's just some really simple exercise. Um, and like yeah. Abby says right here, you help yourself by making these simple little changes. And yeah. I didn't give up meat, but I reduced my meal. So now when you look at it, it's not a great big giant ribeye. And for those of you guys who are watching yeah. last night, I did not get to go out and get my ribeye today. I, wow, sorry, I man, sorry. can't remember what I ate for lunch, uh, but it was here in the house. I have not left the house except for walking today. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, you were on the show, I think, last night. I think you were in the audience. I was looking so forward to the ribeye. And a few people have asked in the comments, did I get it? But yeah. now my plate has veggies, like on purpose, yeah. like steamed broccoli, carrots and stuff, some asparagus. Um, it's not this high processed food that comes in a box that can, for some reason, sit on the shelf for years and not rot. Yeah. But you add some water and you heat it up and all of a sudden it's supposed to be a meal loaded with yeah. carbs and sugar, none of that. Um, and so the other thing you have to realize too, what's interesting is, you know, um, kidney disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, all the diseases and unhealthiness is not limited to patients. You have to remember a lot of these doctors, nurses, um, dietitians, especially here in San Antonio, that they, they themselves have these problems too. So, you know, yep. I don't like, so I, I'm not trying to like brag or something like that, but I do relatively eat well. I exercise every morning. So when I say something to people, it has legitimacy, yep. right? It ha and I can relate to you. So I can tell you, hey, James, you know, I know there's low-carb bread at Costco. You mm -hmm. can try. Hey, you know, there's uh, we have a big Hispanic population here. Hey, they, uh, they make a low-carb tortilla. You know, I can, I can point you in the right direction as far as – because I have personal experience in it, right? Right, right, right. Or even exercise. So I can say, hey, you know, start off with a walk, but maybe consider getting an elliptical trainer or a rower. Doing, doing other things, getting a gym membership, um, getting a trainer, you know, so I can relate to these things when I say that. And so and I really believe that's going to be the key to um, making your health overall better. It's not just getting that next medication, you know. Yep. Um, yeah. so, so in your opinion, what are the things that a kidney patient can do to help themselves? What are, what are probably some of the most important? You kind of talked about exercise, but I guess yeah. that's adjusting. That's addressing weight. How how much of an impact are made? I guess we'll start there. How much of an impact is being overweight to a kidney patient? Overweight. Future? So, um, oh, being overweight is is a disease. Uh, not disease. I would say is a you know almost like a disease on itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, at a certain point, you develop what we call metabolic syndrome, diabetes, high blood pressure, all those kind of things. Yep. So, having that extra weight on you can have a dramatic effect on you. Um, um, and the problem we have now is, especially in Texas, and you're in Ohio, but the the fat or obese model becomes the norm. And so it is the norm here. It is. Obese, you you like I get called skinny all the time, and I yep. am not skinny. I I am a normal average forty year old male. That's how, what you're supposed to you know be at. Um, but I think that's what happens is you get you get your your people around you kind of make make you into that. Now having weight on you, 10, 20, 30 pounds. Believe it or not, worsens your um, high blood pressure. So it can cause high blood pressure. It can worsen it. I've seen numerous people lose weight and come off of high blood pressure medications yep. or or decrease their dose. You know, There is something that we call essential hypertension, which means you develop high blood pressure over time as we age, and you know that's there. So there is a case that, 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 um, that happens, but I've seen people go from three to one blood pressure medication, right, because yep. they lost 20 pounds. And that is any time you can reduce the number of pills you're taking, not only are you going to save money, yeah. but they all come with a list of side effects that we have to worry about in interaction. So that is yeah. you know, another reason to lose weight if you could possibly reduce. So I yeah. take my blood pressure medication, uh, one pill I take three of in the morning. I think I take three, four, five, six, seven pills in the morning and two in the late evening. So I'm taking... Oh my goodness, nine pills a day just to manage wow. my blood pressure. And I wow. am an average adult for Ohio, which means very <laughs> overweight. <Yeah. laughs> and I would love to eventually get down to maybe I just need a couple pills to manage my blood pressure. That would be awesome to me. And all yeah, of my and pills- Yeah, and time invested, right? Just the time yeah. invested to manage it then, you know? And they so. all have- have symptoms usually if i if i if i don't take them at the right time oh my goodness i i'm fighting to stay awake and they will knock yeah. me out 
Uh, yeah. And, the, and there's some of them I have to take in the evening and it's a, it's a small, it's a 0.3 milligram of something. I take a 0.2 in the morning and a 0.3 in the evening. If I accidentally reverse those and I've done that, by accident, yeah, been in the kitchen, taking my pills in the morning, my wife's talking to me and I accidentally grab the wrong dose and I take, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna, this is gonna knock me out. And it's just, it's 50% more going from 0.2 to 0.3. But um, I would love, and I, I know I got a lot of weight to lose. I would love to be able to reduce my blood pressure medication. So I'm working on my weight, uh, probably not working yeah. on as hard as I should. I need to, I need yeah. to, ramp it up well the other the other thing it does too is like losing weight actually um increase uh sorry uh okay. increases your insulin sensitivity right so if you're a diabetic it can actually improve that right so it can actually improve um your uh diabetes as well too mm -hmm. so that's that's a that's a big thing like diabetes and have blood pressure so you know the thing is we have all these ranges of kidney disease right you have, you have, you have this, probably some listeners, uh, watchers aren't here right now. They've got IgA nephropathy, polycystic kidney disease, lupus nephritis, yep. all these fancy diseases. But those diseases in total represent about 30, 35% of kidney disease in the United States. The vast majority of kidney disease in the United States, um, about 65% is due to diabetes, high blood pressure, and vascular disease. That means those are preventable illness. That means 65% of kidney yeah. disease is, is reversible or, or, or can get improved or be maintained by diet and, and diet lifestyle modifications. And yep. what's funny is, you know, even the people with the people with the lupus and the IJ nephropathies and all these all these other diseases, sometimes when you're doing these biopsies, yeah, you're going in there and you see an IJ nephropathy, but sometimes they also see diabetic lesions too or hypertensive mm -hmm. lesions too. So, even if you don't have the diabetic nephropathy and have, you know, sometimes when you go in there and you have an IJ nephropathy, you may have diabetic lesions too. So, you can have a mixed picture in there. So, yep. You know, improving your overall health, uh, getting rid of the diabetes and high blood pressure, losing weight, it to me is the is just the biggest thing we can do. I remember hearing if Americans all lost like 10, 20 pounds, there would be we, Medicare would be solvent. There'd be no healthcare crisis in America. You know, uh -huh. um, I, I just made I didn't make that up, but I heard that. You know, like if you would actually we all lose that weight, um, that could have a dramatic effect on everyone's overall health. And then you you not even to get your I'm pretty sure you you witnessed this too. When you lost the weight, man, you probably psychologically felt a ton better. Oh right? yes, your, certainly. Your sleep got better. Um, as a matter knees, of holy crap, <laughs> as <laughs> a matter of fact, face. I even yeah. went to the swimming pool and swam, wearing only yeah. swimming trunks, not oh, a shirt. Right. <laughs> that is yeah. a huge change. Now I'm sure yeah. that some of the other people around there were like, ah, that guy still could use a shirt, but I was like, yeah. no, I've lost. I lost so much and I was so, so overweight. I lost a lot of yeah. weight. I'm like, hey, I can go swimming now. I don't have to wear a t-shirt in the swimming pool. And yeah. I felt better. It made me, it, I, when I got dressed, I felt better. I love that. Yeah. Things just fit better. They weren't tight. Sitting yeah. down, my shirt didn't yeah. stretch around my belly. It just went <laughs> as I sat down. Yeah. No, and, and that's a big thing too. This is the psychological component of it too. When you just lose that weight, um, it, it, it helps you mentally, uh, improves your quality of life, um, mm -hmm. and then stimulates you to do more and, and make better, healthier choices. So yep. um, I think, you know, starting from there, you know, again, uh, I'm not prescribing one diet in particular, and we can go over diets if you like, but um, in general, like, I think, you know, starting by making those changes, those small, subtle changes will make a huge difference. You know, what's funny is in America, we have like all these big problems, right? Like, um, you know, diabetes, diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, obesity, you have obesity. And what do we do to fight obesity? We do like, we do, you know, six minute abs, or we do like, you know, <laughs> CrossFit, or we do these extreme measures that no one keeps up with, right? And I'm yeah. not against those. If you do CrossFit and you have that team combiner with your, with your coffee, with those people there, that's totally cool. But yeah. most people, when they do these extreme things, they do that for about, you know, a week, two, maybe a few months, but then they drop off. So I'm all about making small, subtle changes and maintaining those over years. That's actually a better goal for me. You know, um, if you came to me, like, I would just be like, hey, man, James, do you drink sodas, man? No? Yeah? Stop sodas. Yep. Next time I see you in three months, we'll talk about what the next step is. Because I don't want to overwhelm you with, Okay, stop sodas, stop bread, stop potatoes, stop, you know, blah, 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 blah. You have if to start If it's too much, we're unlikely out. to do it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I've seen people check out like so many times, you know, and I, even myself, like I've, I've, I've lost weight, I've gotten fatter, well, you know, um, but you know, when you overwhelm people and that's the thing when doctors or, or even dietitians, um, you know, they're, they're, they're blessed with knowledge, but if you just, <laughs> you just vomit that knowledge on people, like yep. <laughs> they're not going to take it. You know, they, they need to be kind of spoon fed it slowly in order for them to incorporate, unless again, they have a come to Jesus moment like you did. Yep, yep. <laughs> but, you know, I don't want people to come to Jesus. I want people to kind of, I don't want them to, that sounded really bad. Right. <laughs> we don't, don't want them we to, don't have have to have to be forced to, forced to make yeah. that decision make, and make those changes. Yeah. You want them to do it earlier, yeah. not when yeah. it's like, hey, you're at death's door knocking it. <clears throat> nope, nope, too late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've even had uh, one of, I did a video on plant based nutrition and how it actually improves kidney health and stuff like that. Yep. And one person commented on YouTube how it not only improved, leveled off their kidney health, it actually improved it and got it better. So, yep. you know, there's, there's different choices out there that you can make or incorporate, you know. Yeah. Now, now, as far as like weight loss, and that's a challenge yeah. so many of us face, how do you recommend, and, and it's very rare to hear a nephrologist talk about mm -hmm. things like that, about nutrition, weight loss, even though it makes sense. It's like, this is part of the problem. Let's treat yeah. that instead of just masking things until you need wow. dialysis. Um, how do yeah. you, or, or what are your recommendations for kidney patients to get started on losing weight? What have you seen that's worked in your experience? So this is the thing, to be honest with you. So like, again, like with your frustrations is not finding a nephrologist. My, my frustrations is not finding patients that are receptive to it. You see yep. what I'm saying? So um, oftentimes I give my spiel, but it lands on deaf ears, doesn't come there. But in general, I can't give recommendations on all kidney patients because not all kidney patients are exactly the same. Right. Right. So, you know, you may have a lot of our patients, you know, um, kidney, kidney patients don't die of kidney disease. They typically die of heart disease. Right. So when they die, it's like 90 percent of them die of some sort of heart disease, coronary event, um, uh, heart attack, congestive heart failure, something like that. So if you're a kidney patient who has heart, heart issues, you may want to talk to your cardiologist about that, uh, about yeah. what kind of exercise you can do. What's funny is in medicine, oftentimes they tell you not to exercise, which is crazy to me. But, you know, I'm, I, you know, like, you know, like I've seen people saying, oh, you know, rest and blah, 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 like, you know, don't do stuff. And I'm like, dude, like I want this person active. You know, I want these people walking right. and doing things. They, they don't have so to be doing I, high intensity training, but they need to be doing something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, again, if you're a 30 year old dry, diagnosed by IG nephropathy, then you can knock yourself out, maybe do, you know, uh, you know, CrossFit or something like that. If mm -hmm. you like, or go more high intensity. Um, I don't necessarily agree with it, but you know, you're more free to do that. Now, if you're 70, I would not want you to do, you know, high intensity training right off the bat. Um, right. I, I think a good place to start is always like if you are a person who does not exercise, does not do anything, with the standard American does not eat well, start off with just walk. Perfect. Just walk. And I'm saying just 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Um, yep. Go walking in your uh, your neighborhood, go to your mall. I mean, I've, I've done talks on kidney disease at a mall around here, and they have these mall walkers, and it's older people just walk in the mall. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead, walk. I, obviously, now we're in the COVID situation, so this is a little different now. So right. Maybe the malls aren't open. I, think, I, I, um, I even talked to my wife earlier. I was like, I wish the malls were open just because it's air conditioned, and I could go yeah. in there and walk and get my steps because it has been hard the last mm, three weeks here in Ohio with 90 plus degree days, the sun, yeah. no breeze, high humidity. Um, yeah. That's my favorite thing is just getting out. And now I do at least 10,000 steps a day. Um, cool. And I and I break it up. I do a little bit in the morning, a little bit at lunch, a little in the late evenings. I miss that hot, hot, you know, that 10 a.m. to 2 pretty much time of day when it's super hot here. And yeah. it's worked out so well for me. It's easy to get it in. I don't feel so like you, I'm really exercising. Yeah. So what's interesting is, so like what I did, one of the biggest, I, I think we talked about this before, but I was 30 pounds heavier when I first started like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was that, that weight you put on like your 30s, your early 30s and you're, you know, getting, having kids and stuff. And I just started decided to lose it. One of the best changes I ever made was starting to exercise in the morning. And it's, I wake up every morning about 5, 5.30, 6, somewhere around there half an hour, 45 minutes of exercise. Yep. So that could be their walk time, you know, before, before work. And what's great is 
um, I, what, what's great is when you do it in the mornings, it's out of your way. So you wake up, yep. you get this little boost of exercise, and then you, the rest of your day is gone. And you know, I, it, you know uh, um, I, I can't come home and be like, I'm going to go actually get exercise for 30 minutes, honey. You know, my, put the kids out. You know, so it's actually a more convenient time. I think. Yep. Um, but also, if you're ex- like like yourself, um, you're relatively healthy. If you're doing if you're doing like 30 minutes a day of walk of walking, you know, push yourself a little bit, make it more brisk. Make it more brisk um, yep. and see, um, you know, and kind of push yourself there. Then graduate maybe to a gentle run or like a, a, a walk. Again, everyone's different. So talk to yep. cardiologists if you have heart issues. But I, I can't imagine people being against exercise to some degree, you know. Um, another problem is, you know, the biggest problem we have right now is sedentary lifestyle. I'm sorry. I've noticed, I, I know my patients, are, all they're doing oh. is staying at home and sitting oh, yeah. at home hey, watching we, Netflix. Now, yeah, exactly. We're into next before, Netflix before, community before, now. Before, or, you know, we're... We're sitting there. We're just streaming one show after another. It'll autoplay. It'll skip yeah. the credits at the end and jump right into the start. Skip the title, yeah. and it it almost feels like those you know Netflix and all them are encouraging us to just become couch potatoes and Absolutely. sit there and watch something. Um, this is a whole separate episode, but we can go into like the uh, shortening of the American attention span, social media's effects on us, and all of other stuff. I know you and I use social media. Yep. A lot of it's got negative side effects on us, you know. Um, oh yeah. Uh, Deb says she likes riding her bike. By the way, that's amazing. She, like, if you like riding a bike, again, I just put put walking out there. You like riding a bike, dude? Please do. Please go. You know. Um, uh, but every anything at all, um, you know, and even at home, I I recommend. You know, uh, I don't know everyone's first personal financial situations, but a decent exercise equipment is going to rush you about $1,000. Um, yeah. So does a TV sometimes, you know? So, so a lot of people have TVs, but a lot of people don't have elliptical trainers. That You can get one of those, a rower. Secondhand, you can get secondhand stuff off of OfferUp, Craigslist, all those kind of things. I don't want you to think it's just rich people that can have home gym equipment, yeah. you know, uh, and, and something that you like. So again – don't get all both legs out with the big things and this and that. If you're never going to use it, it doesn't work by osmosis, right? It doesn't work by osmosis. Exactly. So, <laughs> it doesn't, you know, it doesn't you make you thinner as you hang clothes on it. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you can get something, again, just try something and, you know, and then see if you can stick to it. And shoot, like I said 30 minutes. Um, you know, 10 minutes. Start off with 10. Yep. God, I don't care. Just start off with something and go from there. And then again, small, subtle changes lasting over long periods of time is better than a drastic change for two months. You know, so again, that's that's where I'm at as far as exercise. Yeah, um, and when and again, I started not- exercising, I couldn't walk very far. I mean, my anemia was so bad uh, when yeah. I got out of the ICU, and I just made it a goal: I'm going to walk to the mailbox. And I would take a break, several breaks on the way to the mailbox, but then I got to where I could make it to the mailbox make it back. And I thought, I'm going to the neighbor's driveway, which is very close, extremely close. Uh, yeah. And I would walk down to the mailbox and then walk a little bit further over to their driveway and then walk back. And I remember, I clearly remember this. I was going to walk down the street at one point. I was going to try to get an eighth of a mile away and back to get a quarter of a mile in. And I remember taking my phone into my wife, if I need to, I'm going to call you to come pick me up. I know it's just around the corner, but I just pushed myself a little bit every day and I made small little tiny bits of progress, but then eventually all of a sudden I'm doing five miles a day, not even thinking about it, you know, and it, yeah. all those little things, even if you can't do the big giant things, they add up and they help. Yeah, and, and we, exactly. It's like those, you, you can't win the war unless you win the small battles, right? Yep. So you got to fight the little battles. And so don't think of it as a giant war. I mean, I know if you're 300 pounds and you have diabetes and have leopard shirt, it sounds like, oh my God, this sucks and I'm stuck in this situation. But again, subtle changes made over a long period of time have dramatic can have dramatic causes. Uh, yep. Jan here uses a rowing machine 30 minutes, six days a week. Awesome, Jan. I love rowers, by the way. <laughs> and here's, here's another good one. Too. Exercise videos on YouTube. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Free. We, we really live in the age of no excuses right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you know, like. Um, you oh, know, here's like, one whose mom, who's, his mother, his 88-year-old mother goes into the basement oh, yeah. and pretends to jump rope. That's getting yeah. her moving. She's moving. She's not hurting and, herself. 
Yeah, and again, like, I would never take that away from the 80-year-old. And you know what the weird thing is? I've actually heard people encourage their older parents to take it easy or not do things. And I'm like, God, I'd, I'd rather be a health, you know, healthy 80-year-old and die than, like, an unhealthy 85-year-old and then you're bed all day. You know? Yeah, like, yeah so, exactly. Yeah, you know, um, so – I've seen people just encourage people not, not to exercise or just take it too easy. And I'm like, like, no, it's bad for your bone health. I mean, a lot of times I remember seeing this uh, TED talk one time about just loss of, of muscle mass as we age. Mm -hmm. um, and it was comparing the thigh of a 40 year old man versus like a 70 year old man. And just the, how the mass of that thigh just shrinks and the muscle mass goes down. And that leads to just um, weakness in the, in your core and you're in, you more likely tripping and breaking a hip and all these other things. Yeah. So again, if you were to incorporate exercises, squats, something simple, you know, um, on, on a regular basis, losing your muscle mass, I think those kind of changes can really have a dramatic effect on your life, you know? Um, yeah. and again, like I, I, this is not just for kidney disease, it's for overall health, but exactly. again, 65, 70% of kidney disease is due to your overall health problems, right? Diabetes, high blood pressure, vascular disease. So it's not exclusive to kidney disease. I'm giving general health information yep. here. Um, but unfortunately, you know, but uh, it's not one thing. And that's the problem I have with people with kidney disease, not people with kidney disease, people who want that pill, that, that one stop shop oh, kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> Give me apple cider vinegar. You know, I want apple cider vinegar right now, and that'll cure everything, and it'll prevent my cancer, and it'll cure this. And I'm like, dude, hey, come on. Or CBD oils, new the, the new oh, apple, apple cider vinegar. And again, I, I, I'm, I'm not against these things, by the way. I'm sure yeah. they may have some benefit. I don't know the studies, but again, like, um, they don't cure kidney that, disease. <laughs> they don't cure kidney disease, and maybe there's some medicinal benefits to apple cider vinegar or even CBD oil. There could be. But that does not offset that Snickers bar you have on a daily basis you yeah. know, or those baggage chips <laughs> you have on a daily basis. So you have to actually take those into account. Mm -hmm. uh, you, sure, you know, you, you know, take your take apples out of there if you want. But, yep. you know, incorporate those other changes we're talking about. Yep. So here's a question someone asked, which is a great one, and it fits in with this exercise. Um, as kidney patients, a lot of times we are told to avoid weight training. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on weight training really yeah like as, oh and i've been told that too don't you really don't get into weight training and of course it also includes don't take supplements that contain creatinine that makes sense yeah uh, yeah, yeah but a lot of us here you know avoid weight training what and oh, i'm so guessing I'm i can tell what your response is <laughs> yeah, I'm actually a big fan of weight training. I do weight training myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not like jacked or anything, but keeping muscle tone on you, especially in your 40s like I am, like you want to keep, you want to keep that muscle tone on you. So I'm not sure what the logic is, but you have to remember what creatinine is, right? Creatinine is a lab, right? But it's a it's a very sub, uh, uh, it's a very uh, subjective, not subjective lab, but it's, it's it varies per person, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, creatinine is based off your muscle mass, right? So the more muscle mass you have, the higher your baseline creatinine. Normal baseline creatinine is there from 0 0.8 to 1.2. Um, now, as we age, we lose muscle mass, right? So your creatinine um, kind of your muscle mass creatinine should go down a little bit, but sometimes your kidney function goes down too, so it kind of offsets a little bit. Yeah. But um, what I'm thinking maybe is that maybe because you have more muscle mass on you, that it can oftentimes <laughs> you know increase your creatinine. But that's a good increase in your creatinine. Yeah. You know? So um, I'm not against. <laughs> Now, I, um, now, creatine supplements, um, I don't necessarily think they're bad for your kidneys, but they do turn into creatinine in your blood. Remember, creatinine is, yep. not, a mar is not a marker of kidney disease. It doesn't, it's a marker of muscle breakdown, right? Mm -hmm. But we just use it as a, uh, as a marker of how well your kidneys are working. Yeah, they saying? should be so removing kidney, it and managing it, and exactly. keeping it at a certain so level. It's not, it's not like it's yeah. That's the uh, there's other things that can clean by the kidney too, but creatinine is one we can measure. So if you're yep. taking in creatinine supplements, you're already, you're going to be increasing your creatinine number. So that's going to make management of your diabetes kind of hard because that's going to offset both your creatinine and your eGFR calculation. So that's yep. probably why. Now I have heard people on dialysis being told not to uh, weight train as much. Now that may have to do with their fistulas in their arms, you know, having yeah, yeah. fistulas in their arms. So I've heard, um, you know, like there's some recommendations after after the surgery not to pick up more than 20 or 25 pounds after the surgery for a few weeks. Now I have talked to some surgeons and they say uh, it's okay to work out afterwards, and I don't think it's a problem. Now again, most people aren't going to be doing CrossFit or doing massive weights. 
So if you're just doing basic muscle tone, mm -hmm. I would definitely go for it. Okay. So um, there, and then also there's an issue with like, so you have the fistula here that drains blood into the cavity. If you yep. work out too much and break this muscle up, your pectoris and all those areas, you can actually obstruct the flow. But dude, if you work out that much, you know, like, you, you know, that's a lot. So um, again, basic muscle tone, maintaining that muscle tone, I'm all for. Now, the thing is I would recommend is, um, you know, uh, if you're someone that's kind of brittle, like kind of brittle, never worked out before, I do not recommend just now uh, for, for weight training in particular, maybe not going directly to YouTube, maybe actually consider getting a personal trainer and a personal trainer that knows your age bracket. Right. So exercises that a 20 year old can do, guess what? A 40 year old can't do and a 60 year old can't do. So those are different weight trainers that, um, that, um, you know, the weight, oh, weight trainers, oh my yep. physical trainers, um, um, that they, they concentrate on about different age groups or no different groups. So I would definitely concentrate on them and kind of go from there. Now that's if you want to, um, that's if you want to specifically use weights. Now, yeah. if you want to do those YouTube videos, like that lady was suggesting, I forgot her name. Mm -hmm. Sure. Those are typically like five, three pound weights, you know, get your heart rate up fine. You know, but again, if you want to get into the serious weight training, you know, then you'd have to get a, a possible weight trainer and just to suggest, I actually suggested my parents get weight trainers and personal trainers, um, because at their age, they're in their seventies. Yeah. I wanted to increase muscle mass. I don't want them breaking a hip while doing it, right? So right, right, right. You can wing exercise, right? You can wing a deadlift, you can wing a squat, you can wing, wing bench pressing. But at you know seventy, I wouldn't advise it. So again, a personal trainer may be a good idea. Basic, basic exercise. Again, I, I don't believe in going straight to something extreme. Like again, start with the walking, start right. with the rowing, start with the elliptical trainer. Once you like that and say, hey, look at this, my shirts are fitting better. You want to do some muscle tone? Then look into it. Where you know, just just be just be careful. That's all. Yeah, I'll tell you, a lot of the people in the comments are talking about dancing. That's another form of exercise yeah, I, dance, I do. Right? Yeah. So I do yeah. dance. That's fine with me. That's yeah. cool. I do Richard Simmons sweating to the oldies. I've got them all memorized, all the moves. Yeah. I can do them all. And there is this guy on YouTube that is crazy. Um, he's hilarious to watch. I can't remember his name, but he has. He does all these dances to songs and he has these other people with him. And I try to keep up. My kids love doing him. Uh, and it just gets you moving. You're trying to do all these things. It's, it's popular music. And it's a great way to exercise inside in a small amount of space with the air conditioner. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting? have you heard of the concept of blue zones? There's a book called the blue zones. Have you heard no. of that? No, I haven't heard of that. So the Blue Zones is a, is a book. It's about um, specifically about certain regions of the world that consistently make the 100-mile mark, 100-year-old 100, 100 oh. mark, the century yep. mark, where people constantly make it. And the average lifespan there is 90 years old. These are technically not the whole country, but pockets within that country. Um, they recognize, I think, Okinawa, Japan, um, parts of uh, uh, Greece. Um, and then even in the United States that we were talking about, um, Jehovah's witnesses in, not Jehovah's witnesses, excuse me, seven day Adventists, seven day Adventists in California, Loma Linda, California. Now all these pieces of paper people had in common was one, they had a good religious core. So they had good spiritual kind of network and community. So they had the community, they had the spirituality. Um, they also had, um, um, uh, the, uh, but the other thing they had, activity. So they had activity, and that activity wasn't what we're talking about. It wasn't the rower. It wasn't the elliptical trainer. It was just the walking, going here and there, um, hiking. You know, like in, yep. in, the, in the Pacific, in the Seventh-day Adventists, I guess, Saturday to the Sabbath, and a lot of them spend time not doing anything but hiking, spending time with family. So these kind of activities that, that we do not partake in because we're stuck sedentary in front of Netflix are kind of killing us at this point. So, yeah, yeah. again, like – you don't have to line if you want to line dance. I, I used to have an old couple that she, this lady had, I had she passed, but she, they used to go, um, go go dancing all the time. It was like, you know, like uh, some sort of Latin dancing or something. So, whatever it is that makes you happy, knock yourself out, just stay active, stay off the couch. People yep. are killing them, the couch is killing people, you know. <laughs> so, like, um, so again, just stay, stay active. That's the main thing. Yeah, now, what are your thoughts? Let, uh, I want to kind of shift to another topic here. Um, diabetes or pre-diabetes, yeah. being pre-diabetic. I was classified pre-diabetic. I'm pretty certain I probably crossed into being diabetic, but I didn't get labs 
or and whenever my doctor would want me to go get my a1c checked back in the day i'm like oh no yep. no no i just ate a box of Krispy Kreme. I'm not going in for a while. Yeah. And also there's another box right after that. I was like, darn it. I got to start that three well, month they, time they again. No, those are small donuts. They go easily. Like they're so soft. Yeah, You could take a dozen in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's no fair. Honestly, it's not fair. <laughs> yeah. But what, what are yeah. your recommendations um, for health, for kidney patients that are pre-diabetic? I, what are your thoughts on eating a low carb and, and I'm actually surprised it has not come up here yet. Um, oh yeah, we haven't talked about low carb. Yeah. yeah. Keto. So, we haven't okay, talked so, about keto or any of that low extreme low carb or low carb. What are your thoughts there? So I'm a big fan on lower carb. Okay. Not necessarily low, low carb, but lower carb for sure. So everyone out there that's watching right now, you have to go look up what a carbohydrate carbohydrate is. Okay. So it's carbohydrate is, you know, like almost like a glucose based energy source kind of thing. But there's two types of carbo uh, carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates. So I'm not um, I'm not advocating you get rid of complex carbohydrates. I'm adv advocating you get rid of simple carbohydrates in your diet. OK, so complex carbohydrates are like the veggies, the kale, the, the lettuce, the you know, um, uh, this veggies and solid whole grains, whole organs, that, that kind of stuff. So complex, I would I'm fine with. But the simple carbohydrates, particularly the sugars we're eating and the sugars we're drinking, for God's sakes. Oh, the my goodness. And the, and the, and the sodas, we ha you have to eliminate. Um, so I, I think at this point, and again, it's, it's good for kidney patients, but it's good for your overall, even if you're not a kidney patient. Mm -hmm. um, if you're pre-diabetic, um, there should be a fire under you right now because diabetes is scary. Okay, and I actually made a video called Diabetes Sucks. But, um, See, but, um, that's what makes your videos cool. How many doctors yeah. would make a video called Diabetes Sucks? <laughs> yeah, but, but I don't think people understand the gravity of what diabetes leads to, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you're pre-diabetic, right? So or I was. Just... I no longer am. I went on a reduced carb diet. I watched what I ate. And now my yeah. A1C is normal. I am no longer pre-diabetic. Well, congratulations, man. That's awesome. Uh, all but, like, through diet. No medicine. Yeah. And so, like, that's what being pre told you're pre diabetic. That's essentially like being told, hey, there's a fire in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yes, yeah, luckily there, your house is still fine. But guess what? If it grows, it's going to destroy your house. And so, it leads when you're diabetic, and you, people out there know, uh, depending on the population, too, I've realized this different ethnic groups, racial make with different racial makeups have, have different. Um, outcomes when it comes to diabetes. I'm sorry. Um, yep. People with indigenous blood, some, certain types of Hispanics, myself, South Asians, people who are South Asian descent have very bad outcomes. You can actually go to the American Diabetic Association website. You can see the, the breakdown per ethnic group. So different groups respond differently to it. Um, so in particular here in San Antonio, uh, you see people lose toes, lose fingers oh. because their circulation so for you know um strokes can't you know st uh, heart attacks it's horrible and the kidney disease itself now as far as the diets i would definitely try to cut out simple carbohydrates look up simple carbohydrates starchy things like potatoes um but also you know bread products things like that cut them out i'm not and i'm not a nazi i'm, a, I'm a, i like to eat healthy but i'm not a food nazi so if you want to hang out Friday night with your friends and have that cake, someone just mentioned cake and cookies, knock yourself out. The problem is everyone's having cake and cookies every day. Yeah. And so that's the end problem. So if you want to eat healthy Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday and then you know have Friday night as your night to cheat or do whatever or just enjoy your food, that's fine. But in general, I think cutting down on simple carbohydrate is a very good idea. Um, now, as far as keto, now keto is interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with keto. Um, I just think it's almost I, – uh, I do. I guess I do have a kind of a problem with it. But I don't think it's sustainable. So keto – in order to make – what keto means is essentially you're shifting your body's, um, body's energy source from glucose to fats. So yep. you're sh shifting your body from using glucose as a primary energy source to fats. And in order to do that, you have to take in less than 30 grams of carbs a day, 30 grams of carbs a day. Um, the average American's taking in three to four hundred right now. So good luck with that. You know, so um, I have a hard time believing most people can maintain it. Um, it also, you know, I, I think that that count, that 30 gram count includes some complex carbohydrates. So I'm not against fruits and vegetables in your diet. 
you know, incorporating some fruits and vegetables. And if you're a full diabetic, maybe you should avoid certain fruits with very high glycemic index. Mm -hmm. But I doubt anyone's gotten diabetes from eating raspberries, you know. Um, you know <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you want to, you know, I think you should I, th I think you should look those up. And again, don't just say this, Dr. Bud said, do low carb. I want you to educate yourself. Yep. Go out there and read about simple carbohydrates and limiting the amounts on, on how much you've taken. Maybe 100 grams, 150 grams a day. Maybe you can start counting. Learn how to read a food label, for God's sakes. You mm -hmm. know, that's a big deal. If you actually learn how to read a food label, you totally understand what we're talking about yep. now. Um, and then what's interesting is when you start doing low carb, um, or lower carb diet, or low, lower simple carbs, excuse me, lower simple carbs, um, you actually find options for yourself. Like I know of a low carb flaxseed based bread at Costco that I can tell my patients about, right? I know about this coconut dark chocolate thing at uh, HEB, which are a grocery store. Hey, that's only got three grams of sugar in this little thing. It's a good little snack after dinner. It's only got three grams of sugar. So there's different things out there. These All these options open up. Um, it, once you start looking into it. And right. the other problem I have, a good thing about keto though, keto does open up the, the idea of healthy fats, avocado oil, olive, uh, avocados, olive oil, yep. um, those kind of things too. So that's a good thing. So what I recommend is that you look at different diets, you find what works for you. Again, don't go extreme. Keto is kind of extreme. That's why I'm kind of against it. Mm -hmm. but, it um, but if you can incorporate the ideas of keto, the, the avocados, the olive oils, um, the salmon, whatever, that kind of stuff, and then go, uh, then incorporate that, and then talk about maybe plant-based diets, add, incorporate more plants, incorporate low carb. You can find the mix for you, you for your personal, yep. personal personality, but also your culture or whatever. So that's how I would go go there: lower carb, or lower simple carb. So it's, you, I don't want to eliminate complex carbs. I don't want you eliminating kale, carrots. You know, tomatoes. <laughs> I want yep. you to eliminate, uh, you know, the, the crap, essentially the crap that we, eat, you know, and yep. go from there. So. And and that's pretty much what I've done. I, I, I tried keto. My doctor told me, James, don't you do it. Yeah. I, I knew better. I saw a YouTube video, all these other things. Yeah. I did it. I stuck to it. It was very difficult. My GFR went down a lot. It went down. Really? Yeah. And I did drop weight, but my GFR dropped. And, and my GFR was low to start with. My doctor was like, okay. get up to 30 before you try this. I was like, no, 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 I'm doing it now. Uh, okay. But then we had conversations. He's like, just go low carb. All this processed stuff, all this extra stuff. Avoid that and just be careful. Have an apple. Don't avoid an apple. Raspberries, something yeah. I like. Eat raspberries. Yeah. And yeah, by going yeah. low carb, I've been able to still lose weight for the most part. You know, I haven't been very good with the lockdown. I'm snacking too much. Uh, yeah. But it's been so much easier for me. And I find yeah. it's easier to shop because I can find foods. I'd look at the labels. So once you have that mindset, things open up. Again, yeah. things open up for you when you start having that mindset. What's interesting is all these diets we're talking about, whether it be South Beach, Paleo, uh, plant-based, vegan, whatever, what, what they all have, or keto, what, what they all have in common is that they, first off, concentrate on caloric restriction, right? So meaning you're limiting your calories, right? The yeah. average person um, consumes way too many calories. So you're talking mm -hmm. about caloric restriction. Um, the other concept is typically getting rid of processed food. So that's another good thing. It's all they have in common. And then, um, and a lot of them have a more plant-based nutrition and lower carbs. And so, those are the kind of concepts you want to take away from all of them. And that's how, that's how I think that's best for benefit. Yeah. Now, if someone is, when we talked about prediabetes and diabetes, um, I pretty much automatically assume type two. Uh, yeah. Is it the same with type one or is type one different for how they would go about it? Different, different mechanism. So when yeah. you talk about type two, uh, type one, you got to put it in a different category, right? It's not the same category. Yep. Um, but the breakdown typically in the United States is like 90% is type two, which means it's you know lifestyle or, or based, whereas 10% uh, is uh, type one. Although there is this new thing about type 1.5, where it's like people develop a, almost like a type one later in life, they yep. say, and their 20s and stuff like that. So um, 
someone called me out on that because of the, the diabetes sucks video and then I looked into it. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> I'd never heard of that. One of those overzealous moms. One of those overzealous moms. Um, but, you know, um, anyway, so, but type one is a different disease. You're born. So the way diabetes works is that, you know, um, you're taking sugar, you're taking sugar, your blood sugar goes up and then to compensate your pancreas secretes insulin, right? And then that insulin brings your blood sugars down. What happens in, in type, uh, type one diabetes, your pancreas doesn't secrete that insulin. So your blood sugars are just up, right? Yep. And they stay high and you actually need insulin for the rest of your life. So those oral diabetic medications don't work. You see what I'm saying? They don't yep. work. You have to take insulin because your body is deficient in insulin, right? Uh, whereas in type 2, what happens is your um, your uh, blood pressure – sorry, your blood sugar goes up, then your insulin goes up. And then what happens is because your blood sugar remains so high – blood sugar – sorry, blood sugar remains high and your blood insulin levels stay so high, you become ins- more and more insulin resistant. So mm-hmm. you actually need more and more insulin to push that same amount of sugar down. Do you see that? Yep. So that's, that's what happens. You have to actually have more and more – so you you're increasing your um, increasing your body's insulin resistance. Um, there's actually another book out there. Um, have you heard of intermittent fasting as well, too? Yep, I do it. I I eat my first meal at noon, and usually I try to get my last bite at six yeah. p.m. And then I I do the daily intermittent fast. I do not snack. <laughs> protocol. You do the sixteen eight protocol, right? That's exactly. That's pretty much what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, 16 eight part right? 16 hours of fast and eight hours of eating, right? Yep. So um, there's a guy. There's a guy that wrote the complete guide to um, intermittent fasting. He's actually a nephrologist, which was great, great because I, when I read that book, I, I, I always have a hard time reading health books because often they were by dietitians or just people that kind of wing it. And so it's kind of nice to hear a nephrologist, you know, talk. Anyway, so um, he talks about it in there, and he actually talks about how. In, uh, diabetes may not be a disease of just high sugar. You may need to start thinking of it as a disease of high insulin levels because we're just in high, higher and higher insulin levels to bring the same amount of sugar down. So our insulin sensitivity has gone down. So um, we may need to rethink the way we're doing it. And he's saying when you do an intermittent fast, you're actually helping reset those uh, those insulin that insulin sensitivity. So that's a, that's an interesting thing to do. The other thing is w- with a uh, uh, what you call it? Uh, intermittent fasting protocols. Mm-hmm. If you're a diabetic and you're on insulin, I would not recommend you do this without um, without um, nutritional support and your doctor's not. Uh, you so. so you cannot be on insulin and have it be on a fast. You will literally bottom out. You see what I'm yep. saying? Your sugar levels will drop. Now, if you're pre-diabetic, you can try it out, obviously. But if you're if you're full-on diabetic, I don't want you messing with it now. Uh, again, the, 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 that nephrologist, I think his name is James Funk, um, he actually introdu- introduces intermittent fasting protocols into his diabetic population, um, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, but he monitors them daily. Like he monitors them on a daily basis, making sure they're up. So again, don't don't play with stuff. Uh, don't play with play with this stuff because it's not that easy, especially if you're diabetic. You have to talk to your doctor and talk to a dietitian about how to actually have stuff. Yeah, and everyone should always work with their doctor or their healthcare team. They're, if they've got a renal nutrition or dietitian, work with them. Um, now, a question I've heard, and I've never, I've never really investigated it. If I was type one and I'm getting, I have a pump to to manage yeah. it. I, I know people who are type one and they use a pump. Um, does that put more stress on the kidneys if I have a pump, which is managing, helping manage my insulin level? Does that Ring a bell. I've I've heard it. Clear. I haven't heard that. But I haven't heard okay. that. Well, now I'm not an endocrinologist, but I have not heard of that. Um, I know plenty of patients on insulin pumps, but uh, if you're on those insulin pumps and you have better glycemic control, that in it in it um, uh, that is uh, uh, that's actually beneficial to your kidneys, right? You don't want the damage of the sugar right on your kidneys. So you know, having if you're having good control. Now I, I do know people that happen to eat bad with the insulin pumps and just turn those suckers up, <laughs> you know, like when they take in that Snickers or they take in those potato chips, you know, just to kind of offset that, bad, uh, um, you know, bad, that, that insulin. But I have not heard that. Yep. Oh, if I may bring up something, I mean, yeah, you yeah, talked yeah. about you know, frustration and stuff like that. And I know a lot of y'all out there may not like your, uh, your nephrologist or whatever. But you got to remember, um, not just not liking them, you, you guys have choices. You have choices as far as nephrologists, you live, especially if you live in the United States and especially if you live in an urban center where there's plenty of nephrologists. So you can look them up on different um, 
health review sites, health grades, vitals, Google, Facebook, different things to kind of get an idea of how they are. And I feel like a lot of times patients feel locked in. They've been to a doctor, therefore yep. that doctor knows them and has to stay with them forever until I die. You know, um, no, it's not the case. They can literally fax or email your, your same labs over to or, or your same notes over to another doctor. So if you don't like that doctor, say you don't find them engaging or, or you don't like them for whatever reason. And I bet patients not like me, believe it or not. Can you believe it? <laughs> <Just kidding. Talk? laughs> but, yeah. The comments about you are so positive in here. I'm not even, I can't even, there's so many of them, I can't even show them up all, all on the screen. Okay. But they well, love what I'm your is, approach. No, people like, don't like my style. You know, yep. I mean, again, I, you don't mean, you know, and that's fine. You know, I've, I got one comment that I talked about, so I'm like, okay. Um, but, you know, different things, you know, happen. But if you don't like someone, don't think you're stuck with them. It's like being in a bad marriage, but all, basing it off a of first date, right? Like, mm -hmm. why would you get married to someone if you don't like them based off a first date? So switch to another one. And, you know, what's cool about your audience is they seem engaged and they want to make well, changes. They are. They, you, these are the people who want, that want the information, that want to improve their life. So these are the yeah. perfect people for you to talk to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, and I, I'm doing this again. Like, I would love to do this. They're again. gobbling it all up. There's so many questions going by. I'm like, I'll try to squeeze some of these in. Yeah. But again, what I would advise again, if you don't like a nephrologist, change them. And don't tell them I said that. But you yeah. can change them. You can get, get a different one. You can uh, move on. The other thing is um, – the other thing is dietitians too. Not all dietitians are made the same either. Mm -hmm. So some dietitians give bad advice or they give just the standard blah advice. So you, yep. if you're into low carb and you want to go low carb, you can find someone that can coach you in it but knows diabetes or knows diabetes and things like that. You want to incorporate that into your lifestyle. Um, but again, if you're in that engaging person, just find that person that's engaging back. You know, yep. it sucks being the the one person in the relationship that wants to have a good time, right? <laughs> or like, yeah. I just wants to. And, and for right? everyone out there, so I've gone through now three nephrologists. At the mm -hmm. at the moment, I currently do not have a nephrologist. Um, oh, you're just winging it now. <laughs> well, well, well my, my primary care physician is taking care of things, but my you last. You're over 30, right? Your GFR is over 30. Yeah, yeah, I'm 33 right? at the last test. <laughs> my. Um, my GF or my, my nephrologist, when COVID started, she decided it was time to, to go move closer to her family to be there. Oh. So she left and I, I haven't gone back to need to visit the nephrologist because I can go and get, yeah. well, I haven't gotten labs because of COVID, but I can always yeah. go to my primary care and get labs. It just comes in on a different app and it shows up like two days later instead of yeah. three hours later if I go to the hospital and do it. Um, yeah. but when the time comes, but if that's I, cool. Again, you're engaged though. So that yep. you're the type oh, of patient highly. that if you went three, yeah. So three months, six months without seeing a doctor, you'd probably still get the labs. You'd probably be able to see your primary and have intelligent questions and oh, know yeah. what's going on. Unfortunately, when I get a lot of patients, sometimes they don't see me for six months to a year and I'm talking, they were CKD stage three. Now they're CKD stage four. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And so uh, I get that exact opposite. What's like, Hey man, you didn't see me for two years and now your kidney, your GFR is 20. You know, and you're coming close to dialysis. So the talk is different, right? It's not about ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which is those medications or low carb diets and stuff like that. Again, I don't know. It's it's less preventative. It's more, hey, we have got to prepare you for dialysis, which is a, which is a sucky talk to have, right? Right, right, exactly. And I feel, and so many people out here, we feel that a lot of nephrologists pretty much assume we're going to end up on dialysis. And actually, someone just asked a question. Um, do all kidney patients end up on dialysis? No, they do not. They, they do not. So a certain percentage do. It depends on your population. I think it depends on your genetic makeup. It also depends on your lifestyle. It depends on the disease process. There's different types of uh, different types of kidney disease, and it depends on them. So you know, I have I have one clinic here where it's in Bernie, which is a small town, and mm -hmm. most of my patients have a gradient of 1.3, and they're 70 years old. Right. And so I'm just kind of monitoring their creatinine. They're probably going to live the rest of their lives without any dialysis, but I'm just there monitoring their creatinine. I yep. have, tw I, but I also have 30, 40 year olds in San Antonio, in proper San Antonio, that, you know, have creatinines of three, 
you know, and I'm just kind of barely keeping them off the houses. It depends on the person. So I can't say all of them make it, certain percentage do, but it depends on what the cause is. It depends on how much the patient actually engages and they control all their comorbid factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, and all this other stuff. And that really depends. Again, I get, I, often that was what's frustrating with me too. Like a lot of times you get patients late. Like again, you're, so you can handle the primary, you can, you get, you can talk to your primary doctor. A lot of primary yeah. doctors, especially <laughs> old school ones, they refer to kidney nephrologists really late. So oftentimes oh, we're getting- That them. is another huge, uh, so many comments in here. Why? <laughs> they ask, can you ask him, why do so many nephrol or so many doctors wait to tell a person, hey, you got some kidney problems until it's so late. It, yeah, I, I, I even see it myself. Old school mentality. Like the uh -huh. old school guys think they can handle it, you know? So they're like, hey, you know, I got this. It's not a big deal. It's a creatinine at 1.5. But again, a creatinine at 1.5 is a relative number, right? So a creatinine at 1.5 in a 22 year old male could be because he plays football and massive muscles, right? Yep. But uh, a creatinine at 1.5 in a 75 year old female, um, that's a pretty high creatinine. That's probably, that could be a GFR of like 30 or 25. You see what I'm saying? Depending yep. on the person and their muscle mass. So what I've seen is people just using creatinine as a gauge and basing it off of that. Oh, the creatinine is only 1.6. What's the big deal? I'll handle this. I, would, I don't. You don't need to see another doctor, right? Kind of thing. Um, and then again, we get them when they're so late, and then it's like, okay, now your kidneys are you know shrunken and small and scarred. There's not really much I can do for you. Right. Um, now, of course, I love having these kind of talks and talking to people that want to make those changes like yourself and get that kidney function up and going from a GFR of what, six that you had or eight? Uh, or eight. Like My that. lowest was eight. Right. And so that was that awful. Oh, I, I yeah, never want to be there ever again. Yeah. Yeah. So if I had you, that, that would have been like fun for me, right? Like, like trying to get that back up, just making dietary changes. Yep. And see, um, I'm the kind of person you tell me to do it, boom, it's done. Let's, let's meet okay. again get labs yeah. and move forward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but that's another frustration. We get, we get the, we get, we get the patients late too. Um, and so at that point, and then, you know, the other thing is too, like, um, you know, generally a lot of the pop patient population, depending on where you are, uh, and the kidney, the kidney disease world is kind of notorious for it. There's, there's a lot of apathy from the patient side too, as far as not engaging and not partaking in your health. Mm -hmm. And so, I think if a, a doctor constantly sees you're in the game 10, 15, 20 years and you just see the same people, the same, not stereotype, the same exact person yep. do the same thing and not make the changes, why would you engage? You know, so it kind of, it kind of not makes you a pessimist, but it just takes it away from you. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So maybe that could be a part of why some nephrologists aren't there. And again, they're analytical dorks as well too. So like, <laughs> yep. and, and I feel like, there's, there's not, or, I don't know how to how to say it, but there's not enough education about obesity, diabetes, heart problems, and and kidney issues. I, my mom has stage three; she has yeah. kidney disease. It was not even on my radar. I had high yeah. blood pressure. I was managing with pills. I was obese. I was taking ibuprofen after the car accident while I was recovering um, yeah. for a year. No, yeah. it didn't even enter my mind. Uh oh, what's this doing to my kidneys? Until that doctor with the name I couldn't pronounce back then, a nephrologist, came in with lots of big words renal this, renal that, failure. I'm like, transplant, what, 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 what? I think yeah. we're missing that education for kidney yeah. patients of just how serious this is. And even when I was in the ICU, she kept trying to explain to me, this is serious. I remember her saying it so many times. And I, the, the, when it got through to me, it was when she says, you need dialysis. Again, I'm not listening, really. And she says, otherwise, in 45 days, your wife will be picking out your casket. And that right there, that statement, I remember yeah. it. And that was the moment when I was like, holy cow, this is serious. I have to do stuff now. And, yeah. and I think we're missing that as, as a country, or actually as a world, because kidney disease. Um, well, the, I, the I, thing with kidney disease too, it, it's, it's a silent killer, right? By the yep. time you feel it, it's way too late. So you could be chilling with an EGFR of 20, you know, just mm -hmm. hanging out, you know, and you're fine. You feel fine. Your body has that much resilient, it's so, so resilient that you just offset that. Yep. You don't typically feel it until your GFR is less than 15. 
or the symptoms of it. So, you know, so that's another thing. But the other side is too, this, the sheer cost of kidney disease. You know, we're talking about, you know, um, with, uh, with dialysis patients make up less than 1% of the Medicare population, but costs over 7% of Medicare dollars go to them. So it's like, it's extremely expensive disease. And that's something that, you know, honestly, we could talk about in a show too. Yeah. <laughs> like, tell you, we have so many people saying this, cost. please have this doctor back guys. He will be back. And yeah, people yeah. are asking, what is your social media um, let me bring it up. I'll bring you up on the screen only. Boom. There's your, your, yeah. um, the at. The ad handle. handle yeah. yeah. Uh, for yeah. Facebook on YouTube, you are under your kidneys, your health, and they'll find yeah. you. So, I think the, yeah, your kidneys, your health, or, or you can just type in at cost and butt MD. I think they, they should, they should come up and you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. That'd be great. I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram as well too. The main platforms right now are Facebook and LinkedIn. I do post on uh, on on uh, YouTube like yourself, but I, I I'm trying to get more successful on YouTube. So if y'all can like my page, uh, sorry, subscribe to my We're channel. We're gonna grow your YouTube channel. Pages. Keep putting content there. We're gonna get this. We yeah. got eighty five thousand subscribers plus a ton of people who don't subscribe. You guys should subscribe. Um, <laughs> we're gonna send a bunch of them over there. Start watching that content because it is awesome content on there yeah look at this we got some more stuff yeah people are absolutely loving you um now we did have a question about what is an interventional nephrologist because that is okay your so title. that the interventional part so that means uh, essentially i can inter i guess intervene like so i i um so this there's, there's like this cardiologist and there's interventional cardiologist there's nephrologist and interventional nephrologist so interventional means I can do procedures as well. So mostly nephrologists are cerebral, right? We just think. We look at your labs. We figure it out. And we give you a dialysis prescription. We give you medications, yada, 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 that kind of thing. Interventional essentially means I do extra training and I have a certificate where I do procedures on dialysis access. So again, if you have a dialysis access fish to a graph, um, I can go in there, uh, either clog it, de declog it. If it's clotted, I can put a stent in there. I can balloon it. I can put catheters, the catheters you guys have for dialysis. I put those in, exchange them, fix them. So I can do those kind of things. So that's what the interventional part is. And I, pretty much 50% of my practice is doing that interventional, which is kind of cool. Again, it's kind of cool because I get to see a side. And um, what's interesting in medicine is different levels of satisfaction you get. And when being able to work with your hands, that kind of satisfaction is kind of, kind of, it's kind of nice to change it up with just yep. kind of this medical clinical work. So. Yeah, and then here's a great question that I definitely want to address because this is how I got my kidneys in such bad shape. I was in a very bad car accident. Uh, my back, it's still messed up to this day. Uh, but while I was recovering the first year, I was just popping ibuprofen. I never exceeded the maximum daily dose. As a matter of fact, I was taking the children's dose because I have kids, so I was just taking the small in case they accidentally grabbed a pill. But at night, I was taking an Advil PM, more ibuprofen. And Barbara here is like, I read that NSAIDs harm the kidney if taken long term. And then there was a, another yeah. question that if you stop, can it improve your, um, your numbers, your, your kidney function? Uh, yes, absolutely. I actually did a video on this called can't over the counter medications hurt your kidneys or something like that. And, um, yes. So NSAIDs in particular, um, they can hurt your kidneys. Um, now I do take ibuprofen. I do, uh, every once in a while. So if you have a headache, back pain occasionally, no biggie, no big work. Um, but, um, nephrologists are kind of NSAID Nazis. And so NSAIDs are pretty much the not, they're non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs as include ibuprofen, naproxen. A Motrin, those kind of things. Does not include Tylenol. Tylenol is not, not, is not an NSAID. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you take it in excessive amounts for long periods of time, it can cause kidney injury. So it can cause it. So if you're taking it, say you have really bad back pain, you take it three times a day for you know, three, three months, yeah, you can't hurt your kidneys. Okay? Yep. Um, so I would definitely think um, you, uh, you, should, you should limit it. As, and if you're a kidney patient, you already have kidney disease, you should probably not take it. Now, as far as um, as far as uh, uh, take uh, take me, uh, sorry, what were we going at? <laughs> as far as taking them, yeah, I would, I would, I would not. I'm not totally against them. Again, taking them in, in small amounts, that's fine. Yep. Oh, the question was, can you is it reversible? Yes, I have right, some right. reversible. So, like when you told me it was um, 
uh, you reversed and you got better. I've seen that before. I have another guy, a black guy I remember coming to me. He's like seven years old and his GFR was like 16. I'm like, hey, man, start, I'm gonna start dialysis. Oh my God, the whole talk and blah, blah, blah. I stopped his NSAIDs and then about three months later, his GFR is over 30. And so wow, awesome. um, just by stopping. Now, the thing is, if you're on it long enough, it can cause – um, irreparable damage too. So you got to remember that it's not completely reversible. It can't, yeah. if, if the damage lasts long enough, it can't scar up the kidneys and things last a long time. So I, I have one patient in particular, I can think of it. I have one on peritoneal dialysis. Um, he came to me and his kidneys were already shrunken and small, but he used ibuprofen. He was popping ibuprofen for years. Like it's like it's a uh, candy yep. and his kidneys are shot and he's on dialysis for life. So um, for the most part, yeah, you're reversible, but if you're taking it for a long period of time, it can't have long-term effects for sure. Yeah. And I know, you know, I have had the ultrasounds, a lot of ultrasounds and my kidneys are shriveled and scarred. And my original nephrologist told me, hey, this GFR 13, this is the best you're going to get. But going off of them, um, looking at exercise, looking at diet, making what really ended up being simple changes to my life um, yeah. allowed me to get you know up to GFR 33, which I'm, I am so happy to be here because I have no symptoms and I've gotten all my energy back. My anemia, gone, doesn't exist yeah. anymore. Uh, yeah. And I'm happy. And my my current, the last time I talked about my future with my healthcare team, they said, look, if you stick with this and, and nothing else goes wrong, you know, but stick to being healthy, live healthy, you should be able to live the rest of your life normally, not need dialysis. And if I if I if my kidneys do get to where I need something, I may have bought enough time, as in decades, to where there may yeah. be alternatives Besides dialysis, and I am so thrilled with that because it gave me my life back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can talk about that sometime too, the future of nephrology and where it's going and stuff like that as well too. But yep. um, yeah, no, absolutely. I think just pushing it out more, that's the key thing. Like, and especially if you're older, you're, you're 67 years old and you take your GFR to 30 something from 16, you may just live the rest of your life without dialysis. You know? Yeah. Um, you may just live, you just, you outlive your kidneys. Problem is now, um, um, you you sorry. You problem is that most people are outliving their kidneys, and their kidneys not outliving them, right? Yeah. So like, <laughs> you know, so that's the problem. So. Now, a quick question because we, we have had a lot of it, and I know we're getting a little late. Uh, a lot of people have asked about anemia because that is a common problem, um, stage four, especially getting close to stage five, hitting stage five. Um, yeah. Any tips? I know you cannot treat these people because you haven't seen our labs. You're not our doctor. Uh, but yeah. any general tips to help with managing and avoiding anemia? Just to let you know, here's what I did. It was diet. I had to get more iron because mine was iron deficiency. Um, yeah. I had to get more, I think it was B9, B12, and I needed some vitamin C or something. But I changed my diet and... My red blood cell count went up. My hemoglobins went up over time rather quickly to me. It was maybe four months, five months. Um, yeah. And I was, I've been good. Uh, yeah. What are your general tips? So you have to understand like um, diet, anemia is common, especially in late state kidney disease. And you have to understand that the kidneys play a role. Again, the kidneys are such a complex organ. Mm -hmm. um, they play a role in your anemia. So um, your kidneys, um, again, they secrete a hormone called erythropoietin. Okay, erythropoietin yep. actually stimulates your bone marrow to make blood. Okay, as your kidney function gets down and as your kidneys shrink, right, their 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 ability to make that hormone, that erythropoietin, goes down. So automatically, your 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 um, your uh, hemoglobin count goes down. Right, yep. your normal hemoglobin is around twelve to thirteen. It slowly comes down. Okay. The other thing you have to realize is people, especially CKD stage four or less, uh, their absorption of iron goes down. So you know, you and you and I may have a steak or may have some spinach, and we all absorb all that iron. But a kidney patient at late stage cannot absorb oral iron this, uh, or absorb iron orally the same way a regular person can. You see what I'm saying? Yep, yep. So that's another problem that they have. Um, so that's why on dialysis patients in particular, we have to give them IV iron. We have to give them iron directly into their veins. 
um, because they can't absorb it there. Now, in your particular situation, yeah, the iron deficiency correct and iron deficiency help, but you're just the sheer factor of kidney function corrected help the help the help the help you make more blood and probably your ability to make erythropoietin came back. Do you see what yep. I'm saying? Yep. So yep. you're taking your GFR from six to you know to over thirty. You do you just your your ability to make that erythropoietin came back, and now that you're eating more iron, that that helped as well too. Um, so and again, your story reminds me of that black gentleman I was telling you about. Same thing. His he had anemia too. Hemoglobin was like eight after his kidney corrected. His hemoglobin was above twelve without me giving any any, um, any erythropoietin or anything like that or what you call ESA. So overall, the, 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 comp the anemia management is kind of difficult. Again, I would ask to check your B12 levels, your folate levels as well too. So check your B like B12 folate levels. Check your iron levels. You don't have to check it every single time. B12 and folate maybe every six months. Iron studies maybe every six months as well. So you don't have to get them checked every single time. Don't think you got to get labs all the time. Every lab every time. Yep. You know, you probably see a creatinine and BUN and all that good stuff. The electrolytes done every single time, but definitely ask those. Make sure to partake in that management. You know, if you're anemic, again, hemoglobin is a big thing. This is where the education comes in. But knowing where your hemoglobin should be at, be, be in to, your, your hemoglobin again normally is hemoglobin should be at twelve. But our our target for kidney patients is a hemoglobin of ten or greater. So we want yep. to make sure your hemoglobin stays above ten or greater. So if your hemoglobin is above ten and you're a late stage CKD, you're good. You see what I'm saying? Yep. The other thing about anemia, so we're talking about the kidney's role in uh, uh, anemia management, but also, you know, if you're older, 50 years old or so, you want to make sure you don't have any what we call GI losses of the blood, right? Meaning your GI tract isn't losing blood. So you want to make sure you're up to date on colonoscopies, um, EG, you know, EGDs and all that good stuff, you know. Um, so you want to make sure you're up to that because you want to make sure there's no blood leaking from, say, a cancer or like, I, uh, or bleeding vessel or something like that in your GI yeah. tract. So that's the other thing you want to make sure you kind of kind of kind of watch there too. I do not so, look forward as, to that when I turn fifty. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not looking, looking forward to that one either. But you know, again, if you're dealing with anemia, you got to make sure you're not bleed, losing blood too. You see what right. I'm saying? So that's the concern. So. Yeah. Now we've had a number of people ask, do you do telemedicine? Are you, are they, able I do, to... yeah, we do telemedicine. So I actually have been doing telemedicine during the, especially the COVID time. I have been doing it. Um, and I do it pretty regularly. If you're in San Antonio or in Texas somewhere, you can always try to uh, look me up. You can look me up on Facebook and then you can always call or message me and then I can kind of get it. Do not ask for medical advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do not ask for a freebie. That's not a freebie, but it's like, I can't use, I can't use an instant messenger to do that, but I can say, uh, in the messenger, I can't say, "Hey, uh, call, tell my office tomorrow. Call this person, and we can set up an appointment or something." Like that. Yep. So. And here's a really good question, and, and and then we'll wrap this up. Um, and I really appreciate all your time. I know we've gone well over an hour. Um, yeah. And this is a question I get asked all the time, and I think it would be great to let everyone know. Um, Argyle asks, is, "Does kidney?" I'm going to rephrase the question. Does your kidney GFR fluctuate naturally? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, we are human beings. We are not set numbers. Okay. Just like you check your blood pressure when you go to the doctor's office, it's 120 over 80. And the next time you see it's 135 over 70. That's this natural fluctuation. They kind of, we can talk about high blood pressure in episode two. That'd be kind mm -hmm. of a cool thing. But in general, that can fluctuate, right? Just like that. Um, your creatinine is not always going to be 1.2 or 1.3. It's going to kind of fluctuate. So it can go from 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1 maybe you know 1.1, 0 0.9. As long as it's fluctuating, say you're say you're let's just say you have CKD3 and your your creatinine is 1.5, right? If um, you know if it goes to 1.7, no biggie. But yep. if it goes to 1.9, the next time that's kind of a concern. Do you see what I'm saying? And yep. the same thing with the GFR. Remember the GFR just takes the creatinine into account. And throws in your age and all these other factors and kind of comes up with a number. Your GFR can fluctuate. It's just watching that pattern. So you want to see that pattern go like this, not like this. You don't want to see the GFR go down, right? So you right. want to make sure that it's staying steady. And if it's consistently going down, then there's things, maybe some adjustments in your medications, particularly if you're on diuretics like Lasix, Fernalactone, and all those kind of diuretics. Maybe your nephrologist makes some adjustments to kind of offset that. So. Yep. And and if I see. And I'm just asking this, I'm asking this for a friend. <laughs> and actually, yeah, I am asking it for someone else because I, I, I've asked these questions to my nephrologist. Um, should I panic if my GFR 
suddenly was down three if I went from a 36 to a 33? No, I would consider that normal variability. Um, it, it really depends. It really depends on the individual. And then what I do is I typically go back and look at their previous labs. So what I've noticed is some people have a baseline creatinine of 1.5 to 2.0. That's their baseline, 1.5, 2.0. And yep. they just kind of fluctuate there. Do you see what I'm saying? And yep. that could be a significant change in GFR of at least 10. You know? So it depends on the human being and it depends on themselves. So as long as you're staying within that range, I always go back and say, so if you have a big drop, let's just say you went from creatinine, went from, uh, so the GFR thing, say you went from 36 to 33. Mm -hmm. Well, Doc, can you look in the past and see, it, has it been in this range before? And that can kind of alleviate any of the fears you have. So. Yep, and I, I get my labs, or I used to get them extremely often, far more than most people did. I would go once a month to the hospital, get them there, and then every other month I'd get an extra one from my primary care. So some months yeah. I got them twice. So I, was, I was like, every two weeks, three weeks, I wanted to have my labs. Yeah. Well, and it depends. So like if you're CKD stage five, I would mm -hmm. do it once a month, right? Yeah. Um, or late stage four, maybe once a month, depending on your situation. But generally every three to four months, depending on your current situation. Everyone's different. Everyone's different. But three to four months is okay. It's like almost like checking your la checking your weight every day or like checking your weight twice a day. Like you're just going to make yourself neurotic. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're just kind of going to drive yourself crazy, right? So at that point. I never I check my weight a second time. I'm like, no, I drank water. I can't. It's up. Yeah. But I watch yeah. mine and my GFR, it fluctuates a little bit I, and I get my labs yeah. so often, but I then look at everything else. Am I, you know, my, my CBC, are all my results within the normal range? Yeah, nothing got out of whack. Yeah. So I, I don't let myself get worried. Though I know a lot of yeah. kidney warriors out there, they kind of get a little worried when they see those, those little fluctuations and it's good for them to know that's normal. Yeah, it's okay. Don't 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 go crazy. Again, look into look into your past history. Keep a log of it. Um, and if you don't have a log of it, just ask. Hey, was my GFR this low before or not? Yep. And then kind of go from there. And so sometimes I'll have that patient back. Say I noticed a five point change in the GFR. I'll be like, Hey, you know what? Drink some more water. Maybe I'll adjust this medication. I'll have you back in a month, and then we'll go from there. But there is some normal variability. And you know what I've noticed? Some people sometimes people just get sick. You know, I was like, Hey, dude, your creatinine two weeks ago is way higher than it was before oh yep. doc i had the flu at that time and so that kind of upset it so yep um and we did have a question and i do not know the answer i believe i do know it but i am not certain can gfr be tested on an individual no, GFR, is, can... gfr is not tested right gfr is a calculation right. so it's really based off your blood creatinine your yep. blood bun your age your height all this other stuff so no you can't do an individual gfr um and i, I wouldn't really worry about that too much you know mm -hmm. individually now you again look at your ultrasound i've seen some people born with smaller kidneys on one side like an atrophic kidney on one side and normal other kidneys there and this gfr may be like who knows nothing 10 15 but this gfr may be 60 you know or 70 yep. so it doesn't you know I, I again it's not a blood test e gfr is not a blood test it's a calculation so yeah i think a lot of people mistakenly believe a gfr measures kidney damage which it's not it's just a waste product how much is in there, your kidneys should be keeping it managed. And if they're not working well, it tends to go up. And we use that yeah. to kind of guesstimate our kidney health. All right, well, yeah. I am going to, uh, we're gonna, if we've been almost an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna wrap, there are so many comments saying, come back, come back. They love All the right, idea I'm of blood pressure. Well. And so many of the topics we've talked about. Uh, I want to thank you so much for your time here. Everyone out there, make sure you are subscribing. You're sharing these videos. Uh, there's so much information out there that's just, it's doom and gloom. It's not helping people out. But we're bringing yeah. positive, helpful information from real experts. We've got a real nephrologist right there. Uh, share these videos, please. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. Your Health, Your Kidneys, subscribe to his Facebook page. He puts great stuff out there, videos. Let's show the love, share those things. And don't forget, we will be back tomorrow night with another live session. Let me bring up the schedule real quick. For those that uh, aren't familiar what's coming up tomorrow, we have Jen Hernandez at 6, which is an hour earlier than tonight. We're going to talk about your, your labs and kind of walk through what's important, what to keep an eye on. 
Then we have a, another nephrologist on the 5th at 2 p.m., so a little bit earlier. And we're gonna talk about multivitamins and he's on the board for the um, nephroceuticals that makes Pro Renal Plus D. Then on Thursday, again at 2 p.m., we are gonna talk about probiotics and gut health with Kibo Biotech. And then on August 7th, we have the amazing Sarah Bitter, someone here local in Cincinnati. And we're gonna talk about healthcare for kidney patients and how to get a bigger and stronger voice out there when we are electing new officials so that we can hopefully influence healthcare to meet our needs um, as kidney patients. I thank all of you for joining us for today and sticking with us for an hour and a half. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching everyone. See y'all later. Man.